Vikram Pati, an associate professor at the uh, IIT Bombay. Uh, so kind of uh, walked us through the limits of technology around us in the previous lecture uh, on the 22nd. Um, and today we'll continue from where we left off last time. Uh, to mention once again, the masterclass series are possible only through the generous support uh, of Triveni Turbines Limited. Uh, small housekeeping, same as always. Uh, please post in your questions in the question window as the session progresses. There is no need to wait for the end. Uh, and we will circle back and, and deal with them uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, with this, sir, uh, I hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much again. Um, and thank you everyone for those of you who are joining us. Um, so this was my last slide from last time. So I thought this is a good place for uh, for me to start again. So, you know, next time I said, I promised you that, you know, I'll at least imply to you the, the, the way the use case for drug design and finance would go. And this is what I'll do today, which is um, I'll kind of walk you through the the way in which quantum is this emerging and disruptive technology that has the capacity to affect all of these fields. And I'll show you a flavor of the solution would look like and how this would be solved. Um, I want to kind of commit that um, already that uh, there's a lot of details that I've kind of essentially suppressed in the way that I've presented this. And that's uh, uh, again to take into into account the broad interest of the folks who are coming in, some perhaps from the political science end of the spectrum and policy end of the spectrum, and some from more the technical end of the spectrum. But uh, I'm of course happy to kind of take a uh, take questions or comments and also make a discussion offline about this. Um, okay, so with that, let me just say that uh, the plan for today for the next 15 minutes, 40 minutes or so, is uh, basic quantum mechanics, and then I'll just go through how this basic quantum mechanics. Um, um, which I will re-emphasize from last class, and, and it's a, I just started the discussion last class, so today I'll, I'll really make it, uh, hopefully make it much more clearer, and then I'll point out the use cases for drug design and finance. Okay, so let's get on with a basic quantum mechanics. So again, let me recap to you last time. I said to you that there are a series of experiments, this is historical uh, from a physicist's point of view, historical from the uh, history of science point of view, but also contemporary to our understanding of, uh, of quantum physics and very relevant for today's discussion um, about uh, uh, using quantum computers in, in the way that we are thinking about them uh, in the modern context. And basically, uh, to think of electrons as little bullets uh, from bits to kind of bullets uh, would be a mistake because uh, uh, the universe um, is composed of, um, of fundamental particles like electrons and these objects fundamentally behave in a quantum mechanical fashion and what that means is that uh, is that what you expect to see on the screen if the electrons were little little uh, uh, bullets is you would expect to see two particular uh, strips of the electrons being deposited on the uh, on the on the screen here let's think of it as a silver film that used to be used for photography back in the day um, and instead, what you see is, is the kind of undulating interference pattern that I showed you in the movie last time. And what this led us to was the conclusion that, uh, that I, just am, I just stated this last time without kind of any additional uh, statement, which is basically that if there are two possibilities for the spin, let's say it can be up or down, on the screen here in the way that I've, I've represented the, the video, uh, the, the, the experiment to you, it can, be, it can go left or right. Uh, in fact, it can go left or right in various different locations, and that just means instead of having two choices here up and down, you have a variety of choices which indicate the the position, the transverse position of the of the electron. Then they can all exist in superposition. They can all exist in this kind of thing that we call plus. And now um, the mathematics of this is just linear vector spaces. If for those of you who are perhaps scientists or engineers who are in the STEM field. But let me explain to you what this word superposition means um, in, in words, in actual, in, 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 in a way that going forward. So uh, the crucial thing I want you to think of is that um, if an electron you think of uh, as being up or down is the same as, uh, or is analogous to the electron going left or right, what I'm saying is that the electron is both going left and right before you measure it. 
this is a kind of absurd statement that I'm making, absurd sounding statement that I'm making. And before I tell you what it is, let me tell you what it's not. And what it's not is uh, exemplified very famously by uh, by this thing called the Bertelmann Fox argument. So if you are very interested in the in the physics of this, then I recommend that you write down this phrase and simply Google it. You'll find uh, all of the um, all of the analysis uh, that you would look for. But uh, I am going to tell you now the story of Bertelmann Sox. So the idea is basically the following. Suppose there's a, there's a guy, Bertelmann, who came up with this argument, who always wears um, um, uh, socks in such a way that on one leg, if he wears a blue sock, on the other leg, he'll wear a maroon sock. And what you see is you see basically him walking and then you just see that one of his legs uh, is exposed, let's say his right leg, the pant cuff is a little bit off and you see that he is wearing maroon socks on his right leg. You can immediately conclude that his left leg is, has blue socks on it. This is not what is meant by superposition. Superposition is not this. So before I tell you what it means, I have to tell you what it does not mean. Here, what is happening is that the value of reality that you would attach to the sock, uh, the, the, the value of reality that you would attach to the sock is the color blue or the color purple is already assigned. Bertelmann has decided what to wear when he was getting dressed in the morning. He already decided that on my left leg goes the blue sock and on my right leg goes the purple sock. I simply don't know this information till I see it, right? This is a kind of statistical lack of knowledge that we learn probability theory from high school to handle, basically. And this is not what quantum mechanics is talking about. Quantum mechanics is talking about an even deeper variety of of um, uh, of uncertainty of um, um, of choice in measurement, and that even deeper uh, point of view is that neither this red nor this blue actually is the pre-assigned state of reality to the spin, and and if we was to use an abstract language, I would say up or down, just as kind of two vectors in a vector space, but you think of them as colors, different colors. Um, if this was simply a classical experiment, I would be saying something like this. I would be saying there is a blue spin or there is a purple spin. You don't know it, but it has been assigned beforehand. And when you see it, all you see is you see either a blue or purple. This is not what I'm talking about. What instead I'm talking about is basically that both the blue and the purple, each ball that you look at. So if, to, if you want to go back to this analogy and thing and ask if this was quantum mechanical, how would it behave differently? What it is is that Bert gets up, quantum Bertelman gets up, he w decides to wear something on his left leg and something on his right leg. And when you look at uh, the leg of Bertelman, sometimes you see the sock as red and sometimes you see the sock as blue. But it's not because he made the choice beforehand, it's because the state of existence of that sock is both blue and purple till you see it. Right? So it's a bit of an abstract or trippy um, thing, but let me say it in mathematically precise or rather more simpler uh, quantum mechanical language, which is that the quantum state, which is this state of knowledge, which is this up or down, exists in both up and down possibilities before measuring. So a single electron is neither up nor down, it is actually both. And being both basically means that when you measure it repeatedly, you get different answers. You prepare them precisely the same and you're measuring them precisely the same, but you get di different answers. And this uncertainty is unexplained basically in classical mechanics, because in classical mechanics, if I prepare something the same, like I wear a, a, a blue sock on my left leg and a purple sock on my right leg, the outcome is always the same. I have a, a purple sock on my right leg and a blue sock on my left leg. Whereas only in quantum mechanics um, do you have a deeper form of uncertainty where the state of reality itself is not assigned before you make a measurement. And when you make a measurement, it randomly collapses to one of the answers or the other, right? So I warn you that the word collapse is here loaded and, and requires additional discussion, but let me just skip that for a moment. Now, why is this interesting, right? So I'm saying something about blue socks, purple socks, and coexistence of these socks. What am I saying? What's the, what's the whole point here? The whole point here is that when you want to think of um, mathematical problems and searching 
through mathematical problems when you want to think about problems in cryptography so that you can secure information against eavesdroppers when you want to make credit card transactions all of them are encoded into binary and n bits represent an exponential number of choices so this is the central thing that you would have to understand when you first take a information there are two choices this is what i've indicated by the right arrow and the number two. if i take two coins then i can have heads 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 tails tails heads tails tails and those are four choices that i can make if i have three coins i've enumerated this again for you there are eight choices going from all heads to all tails and you can see the pattern by looking at this you can guess that the pattern is two to the power of the number that i have if i have one coin here it's two to the one if i have two coins here it's two to the two two to the three and what that means is that if I have n coins or n bits, which is what this is, then um, they basically there are two to the n possibilities that this that these coins can be in, right? And this is a this is a math that you can work on. So this two to the n is extremely large. It's an exponentially large space, and um, and this involves basically uh, searching through. Suppose you have to put a uh, put a password in. And the password involves n numbers, but each of them can be 0 or 1. Then you have to search through 2 to the n choices if you've forgotten your password, which means immediately this becomes a very difficult task to do, right? This is the point that I'm trying to convey. In fact, just for completeness, I wanted to say this, that um, in, the actual problem is even wilder than that. And the actual problem is that the number of Boolean functions is even larger. So here is an example of that. Suppose I have a, a Boolean function is something that maps zeros and ones um, sets of zeros and ones to zeros and ones and then there are two varieties it can exist in so um, one of them is for instance i give you the input zero or one you could have these two varieties of inputs where you just give me zero again or one again so it doesn't matter what put you give me you just give me a constant output so these two are called constant uh, output is constant function zero and output is constant function one a uh, constant variable one um, constant one, sorry, constant one. And then there are two kind of functions that you would assume. If you give me a one, I have put one. And then there is the fourth real one here, which is basically uh, the output is actually a flip operator. So if you give me a zero, I flip it and give you a one. If I give you one, I give you a zero, right? So you can think of this in, in terms of coins. So the point I'm making is, I input a coin and the coin is either heads or tails. If I give you heads or tails, irrespective of what you give, which, what you give me, if I return back to your heads or return back to your tails, that's one function, that's another function. If I return back to you what you gave me, that's the identity function. And if I return back to the opposite of what you gave me, I flip return it back to you. That's the flip function. And these are the four. And you can see that already here, for one coin, there are four functions. There is actually two to the power of two to the power of one functions. And so the total number of Boolean functions of n variables is actually 2 to the 2 to the n. It's an, it's a doubly exponential space, and this is something that's actually very important for classical information processing. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the problem at hand. The problem at hand is that if you want to search through, um, if you would think of hacking a password as basically I have a function, and the function takes in some input, and the output is yes or no then you have to fit larger and larger and larger number of choices basically and these choices proliferate quite badly this is one way to think about the problem yeah and so you can think of the difficulty as basically uh, something related to the search space it's not exactly a search space but just for kind of simplifying the argument i'm just saying that this is the search space and here is an example let me give you actually a direct uh, and mathematically relevant example here and the mathematical a relevant example is something called a constant or balanced function. So the so this is basically a function f of x, which takes an, as an input a binary string, an n bit binary string, and outputs basically the zero or one. But it has the following property. The property is that either for every single input it returns either zero or one, a constant output, and that's a constant function. Or for half the inputs it returns zero, and for the other half of the inputs it returns one. That's a balance. 
question. Um, and this is actually very typical of the way computer science operates, which is it constructs abstract functions, which may not have direct practical relevance, but then they use this abstract function to prove ideas about how powerful uh, a particular algorithm is or a particular computer is or a, a particular idea is, right? So just go with the flow. This is an abstract function and input which is basically n bits and take gives an output which is either 0 or 1. And now the task that you have been given is to guess whether this function is e is constant or balanced, right? So just for two bits, inputs and outputs, I've actually written down all of the possible uh, uh, answers here. So let's say the input is zero, you can get all zeros. Zero, one, zero, one, one. So this is a constant function. Another possibility is a constant function is it outputs all ones. And here are the two balanced functions in yellow. For half of them, it outputs zero and half of them, it outputs one. But it doesn't have to be this half. It could be a different half, right? So it could be that the first and the third one, it outputs zero, and the second and the fourth one, it outputs one. So here are some examples of constant functions, and here are some examples of balanced functions that I have just provided for you, just to give you an idea of this abstract function, right? So now the question that I can ask is, if I give you this abstract function, how many calls do you have to, so every time you use the function, which means every time you, uh, you, you want to, so think of this as a slot machine and you have to put in the coin. So you can put in, suppose your choice is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. You have to put in 10 coins all heads, right? N is 10. You have to put in 10 coins as all heads and out pops an answer which is basically zero or one on the screen right so this costs you money this is a machine and it costs you money so every time you use it you have to pay money you have to pay 10 coins let's say one rupee coins 10 one rupee coins worth of money so now the question that i'm asking you is how many uses do you have to uh, you have to make of this machine before you can tell me whether or not this is a constant or a balanced function right remember that the total number of boolean inputs of n variables is two to the n right which means that and what i have just told you about this function is that half of the inputs can be zero and half the inputs uh, half for half the inputs the answer can be zero and half the inputs the answer can be one so i could be hiding the input somewhere right so if you basically for instance how would you proceed for just two qubits uh, two bits how you would proceed is basically you would say i give you zero zero so you feed in two coins both heads and then it puts out an output zero, but maybe this output zero belongs to this output, the blue one, or maybe it belongs to three or belongs to four. So maybe it's a constant function, maybe it's a balanced function, you still don't know. Then what you do is you put in zero one. And if you put in zero one and you get zero, you still don't know because it could be output z output one or output variety three, both of them have zero. You have to feed me a third set of coins. one zero and then if i if it outputs zero you know that this is a constant function but if it outputs one you know that it's a balanced function so you need more than half of the number of attempts for you to tell me the answer right so this is what is what is said here which is classically you need at least three tries for this two cube two bit input so what you need to do is you need to go farther than half mark because i could have hidden my answer somewhere here right and so the question that you can ask is um, so, so if you think of half of the uh, half of the size, then you can ask the question: For n bits, how how much expense is it? Right? You actually have to spend two to the n minus one, right, divided by two. So two to the n minus one amount of money, amount of one rupee coins you have to spend. So take n equals a hundred. It takes a hundred inputs. Two to the hundred minus one. 2 to the 99 rupees you have to spend and you can just work it out uh, on a calculator the 2 to the 99 is what you want to spend right so this is a kind of which is, uh, which is a abstract science problem which basically um, uh, which basically tells you that classically you have to go more than half the way actually to solve this problem basically and this is a very very classic example of a problem that's very hard classically and i'll show you that quantum mechanically it's actually quite simple again i will imply this because again you have to do a quantum mechanics course for you to understand this um, the the answer is basically something called quantum parallelism so let me just show it to you by 
by showing you the the uh, the circuit diagram for this what it does so let me explain it in words because again uh, you would have to do an entire course before you understand this what you do is you take a quantum state zero and you can put it in a superposition of all possible local zeros and ones remember the superposition was the key right and the whole point about why classically this is difficult is because you have to feed it all of these possibilities zero 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 one one zero each one at a time but if you could feed them all in superposition zero zero plus zero one plus one zero plus one one if you could feed this information in superposition then the coin as it goes in exists both as heads and tails and it can then sense all the possible answers that that you can give it and this sensing all possible answers can then be transmitted onto another qubit which you can then read out this is what this circuit diagram does so what this does is it takes a quantum uh, system of n qubits and puts it in a superposition locally of being up and down all up and all each of them up and each of them down in a superposition so it's all zeros all zero and one all zero one zero all zero one one everything all of those are in superposition with each other what this uh, box does is basically it takes this information and computes the answer that you're interested in which is to check whether it's a balanced or constant it's just some mathematical function which i won't get into and embeds that answer basically into by using another additional qubit and then by embedding this answer using another additional qubit you actually have the second powerful thing about quantum mechanics which is that a quantum parallelism helps you search a tremendously large space very quickly and by using this parallelism of of basically uh, of superposition they basically the that the answer can be if the answer is either zero 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 one one zero one one it puts you in a superposition of all four and allows you to search through all four of them together but if you could only do that this is not useful what quantum mechanics also does is it then allows you to take the correct answer that you're looking for and feed it into some into a part of the quantum system that you can read off very easily and what that means is you don't have to waste time looking through an exponential number of solutions i'll, ex I'll explain this point again in a different um in a different example uh, but this example what i want to say to you is that this i just want you to notice that this takes a, 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 um, all spins which are pointing down all zeros and puts them in a superposition of down and up and it does something to it and then it, it basically undoes this exact thing because this h tensor n basically uh, uh, is um, uh, um, is uh, is uh, puts it in a superposition what that means is if you do it twice it simply reverts back to itself this is a mathematical point which i uh, which i should uh, uh, um, uh, explain more carefully but what this machine does at the end of the day is if you detect zero tensor n then you can conclude that basically it's one variety of function um, it's a constant function i think whereas if you conclude if you don't detect zero tensor n then you can uh, conclude immediately that it's a balanced function so by just asking the question here you can act, you can actually have the full answer um, and you only used it once here you have to use it two n minus one time so you have to use it an exponentially large number of times whereas here you use it you use the machine once that's it a constant number of times and this is basically a very powerful example a very primitive example and a very abstract example of how quantum mechanics is much much more powerful in solving a very specific kind of problem than classical mechanics is so this is a very famous algorithm it's called the deutsch jose algorithm again i put this under star so that you can you can look it up and and all of the mathematical details that i've skipped through here for time basically will be available there okay so there is another very classic example of kind of this powerful action which i again want to show you as pictures and analogies not quite uh, fully mathematical and this is what's called an unstructured database search for me to present to you what the abstract nature of uh, this algorithm means so i use an analogy and let me say the analogy is the following i have a function f of x and the function f of x in only one place basically if i give you this red input which i've just given to you will produce the answer one everywhere else on the black inputs will produce the answer zero so it's a kind of lock and key so 
you you input this this key you ask is the key all zeros one zero and and the lock says no and the way it says no is it produces back a zero for you exactly when you give it the key does it say one which means yes now the lock is open and you're you're allowed to enter so think of it as a kind of analogy of a lock and key now if you have this kind of a this kind of a um, um, uh, uh, um, what's called an oracle, somebody who tells you that you got the answer or didn't get the answer. Um, this is basically a very primitive way of thinking about quantum al uh, or computer science algorithms um, and no other additional structure, no uh, notion of derivatives underneath or anything else. Then this is basically what's called an unstructured database search. And an unstructured database search is classically extremely hard you can, because I could hide this basically um, uh, this key completely in the middle of like the, the the stack of possibilities and then you'd have to search through the entire thing in some unfortunate way and so you never hit it basically quantum mechanically what i want to share with you is that this problem is an example of a needle in a haystack right so the problem of hiding a key inside uh, inside a um, inside um, a list of possibilities is like trying to ask you to find a needle in a, a literal needle in a haystack what do you do? What mechanics does is that I've borrowed from the internet here, and what it does is it does something called amplitude amplification. So, not only if you tell me how to find a property of the correct answer, if you can find this is this oracle, yes, no uh, oracle, then what um, uh, the quantum mechanical search does is every time that it runs the search. It amplifies the correct answer. It makes it's like making the needle bigger, and it leaves the haystack uh, slightly smaller. So after some number of iterations, what happens is that the needle is much bigger than the haystack, and you can just pull it out, right? If I gave you a needle this big of a needle in a haystack, visually, you'll just go, yeah, there's the needle. I can see it right there. That's exactly what quantum mechanics does, and this is called the Grover search algorithm. It's named after uh, Love Grover. Uh, who attended IIT Delhi and then went off to IBM where he invented this um, as a point of local uh, history. So again, this is the circuit diagram for one part of the Grover search algorithm. It's, it's, uh, it's quite abstract to explain uh, to you, uh, but the important thing that I want you to take away is basically the square root n here, which is actually quite an important thing, uh, quite an important number, which I will get to. But let me explain to you in, in visual metaphor what this algorithm does. Again, what you do is you stick in a bunch of quantum states and there is a very specific uh, a series of transformations you have to do called unity transformations. These are Hadamard gates and then this is basically something related to the state that you're interested in. And if you do uh, this and this uh, n times basically, so this is called the Grover diffusion operator. When you measure, you have the answer, the needle sticks out of the haystack. But this is quite an abstract way of looking at it. So let me tell you um, in this particular analogy hopefully this is a little bit more simpler to understand let's say that i want you to find an answer i want you to find a key and the key that i want you to find is 011 so visually now i'm explaining to you what the grover search algorithm does what the grover search algorithm does is it flips the correct answer it doesn't know where the correct answer is but it does something where the correct answer flips itself in amplitude so think of this as a if you want to think of this as waves or something then this particular uh, trough basically, uh, this particular crest becomes a trough, it flips itself. And then when you grow, when you do this Grover diffusion operator, what happens is that this trough becomes a crest again, but the crest becomes larger and the rest of the crests become smaller. So you can see these are all the wrong answers and they're de-amplifying themselves. Whereas the right answer, which was equal in amplitude to everything else, amplified itself, it became larger. Right. So visually, that's the metaphor that I want you to take away. So if you do it the correct number of times, which is what this maths tells you, then what happens is that the wrong answers are all deamplified and the right answers are amplified very strongly. And there is an optimal amount of amplification that you can find here. And what that means is that if I gave you a needle in a haystack problem, which is exactly this kind of a problem, then I wanted you to find this, this needle in the haystack. What you do is put it all in a superposition and run this algorithm some number of times and the number of times that you would run basically there is a square root speed up this is the I'll, I'll explain what that means in a second but what it means is that after some optimal number of times if you measure the answer then 
uh, with almost probability close to one, you get the correct answer. Sometimes you fail and then you have to repeat the algorithm, but you just repeat it once more and you get the answer basically. So this square root of n is a fantastic speed up for something where I have given you no promise whatsoever. I didn't, so remember what I asked you to, what, what the question that I asked you. I didn't say in Delhi, please find me in old Delhi, that particular shop, which has the best kebabs, right? That's a very specific question for which you can perhaps find the answer. I simply, instead, I just showed you a lock and said, find me where on earth this lock hanging, right? This is zero information I've given you. There's no structure to the, to the question that I've asked you, right? And that's the unstructured database search. It has tremendous applications all over the place. It's everything under the sun, uh, almost everything under the sun, you can, you can fold it into an unstructured database uh, search kind of uh, question. And there, what it is saying to you is that if you wanted to search um, without using quantum mechanics, let's say you have to have 10,000 runs before you run into the answer. Quantum mechanics promises that by 100 runs, you can solve the problem, right? Square root of 10,000. And that's the speed up that I want you to pay attention to. <clears throat> so it's a tremendous uh, speed up. And these are the kinds of, these are two varieties of speed ups that I've shown you now in analogy, which basically tell you something about how powerful quantum mechanics is. Okay. So now let me uh, turn to the question of uh, how do you apply these kinds of ideas? So fine. Okay. I've said a bunch of things to you about abstract searches of, um, of databases and abstract um, uh, um, uh, solutions to kind of com complicated abstract problems about balanced functions that I've given you. How do you, well, how do you put this into use? Okay, you've said something to me more. I, I'm interested in producing drug design. How do I, how do I put this into use? Okay, fair enough. So let's take that application on. So I want you to think of what chemical design is. Again, this is, you would have this hat and then wear a chemistry hat and, and you'd have to think about this question. I give you the answer again as an analogy. Um, chemical design, basically, chemical, chemical molecules basically sit in a configuration that costs them the least amount of energy. Something that we all know from high school basically, right? If you have a higher energy configuration and a lower energy configuration, the molecule essentially tends to fold itself into the lower energy configuration and sit there. This is exemplified in the cartoon by basically more end up if I roll, if I let it roll, right? Here, because it has larger potential energy than the surface, it might roll out basically. But think of starting the marble over here below X and Y, between X and Y. If I start it between X and Y, X is, has the same positional height as uh, Z. So it will basically roll around for a little bit. And if there is any friction in the problem, it will settle down here. And that's the minimum of the potential, right? So we know this from our everyday experience. If I take a cup and put a marble in it, the marble goes and sits in the bottom of the cup. So um, these kinds of problems um, are basically uh, um, uh, potential minima problems. And the potential minima or maxima, depending on whether you have a minus sign in front of it, the potential minima problems are basically um, exactly the kind of problems that uh, we think of when we think of drug design, right? So you can say, well, is it that simple? Then why don't you just do it on a classical computer, right? If you tell me where will a marble go and settle, it's quite easy, you know, sure, uh, impress you a little bit with the difficulty of the problem. The, there are two difficulties in the problem. The first difficulty is that if your search space is very nice and smooth and it has very nice, well-defined maximas, then you can kind of uh, use standard techniques, the gradient ascent uh, method, which we, Perhaps you remember from high school, perhaps you don't, but there are standard classical techniques that you can use to basically solve this problem. Typically speaking, the real potentials of chemical molecules don't look like this. They're not this smooth and this nice. They look like this. And what that means is that if you try and walk space, immediately caught in one of the local wells. Think of dropping a marble to find where the lowest height is of this potential well of this complicated potential well. Anywhere you drop it, it'll just go sit there because everywhere is a local potential well. And the deepest well is something that you will find very difficult to find, right? So this kind of a space is actually impossible to search through because it's actually very, very jagged. It has bunch of local minima and these bunches of local minima complicate the problem very, very significantly. And this is more or less the kind of problem that you have with quantum mechanics, uh, with uh, trying to search for the ground, 
the ground states of chemical molecules there is additional problems that have to do with quantum mechanics which i uh, which i just leave out for the from the discussion for now but let me just say that this is the beginning of the story basically so uh, again i hand wave through what the actual solution is i'm actually presenting to you uh, one of the kind of path breaking papers in this field uh, um, by uh, uh, a series of people Albert, alberto peruzzo at all i uh, uh, invite you to look up the solution and essentially what you have to do step one of what you would have to do to kind of solve such a problem is have a good description of what the potential uh, surface is corresponding to your molecule so you want to make a drug design and so you have some proposal of a drug and now you want whether or not this is you know uh, this is the this is the candidate for you then what you have to do is you have to convert that drug into basically uh, a mathematical representation which uh, whereby when you search for its ground state like the minimum of the potential well it actually is the solution that you're looking for uh, this is basically uh, uh, writing the hamiltonian down it's some mathematical function that you have to do and you have to do something like this it's it's um, this is uh, um, an abstract mathematical object that i want that i won't deal with anymore and then what you have to do is you have to convert this entire problem into a way that it can actually run on a quantum computer because um, the problem here is that you're not searching through a classical uh, question or searching through uh, questions that have quantum mechanical nature remember after all chemical molecules are, are quantum mechanical objects right and so um, um, this is one of the two places where quantum mechanics is really super uh, quantum computers are really super useful is to search through themselves through uh, you know um, quantum mechanics are the best simulators of themselves and hence when you're trying to solve a problem that is so difficult because it is quantum mechanical, one of the best places for you to try and find a solution is on a quantum computer. So, uh, the way to do this is abstract. Uh, this has to do with uh, trying to take the uh, uh, the problem that you have and convert it into a base which actually can run on a quantum computer. These are technical bits, but I show it to you just to uh, just to impress you with the maths for nothing for no other reason. Um, and then what you would do is you would run something which is basically the analog of a machine learning algorithm. So, and this is perhaps something that you're more familiar with. What you would do is you have a quantum piece of the problem where you're running uh, quantum mechanical simulations on a quantum computer and then out pop some numbers and you take these numbers and you run a classical feedback uh, uh, loop, which is, you know, a classical machine learning loop on top of it. And then you go back and you inform uh, informed by the numbers that you've just collected, you make more quantum state preparations and then you rerun the machine again and again. So this is very similar to the way that you think of machine learning algorithms, except for the fact that this stuff in blue is a quantum processor. And because this stuff in blue is a quantum processor, and this stuff, the dotted line is a quantum expectation value, this cannot be run on classical machines. This is impossible to run on classical machines. And uh, so this, whole technique of solving problems is a kind of technique that has evolved in the less than the last decade and is is you know actually one of the most uh, important oh i forgot to put the number here most important papers is that that paper that i did and what does it look like in real life it really looks like this the circuit diagram looks like this and this is an implementation on a photonic quantum computer it's one of the many varieties of quantum computers that you can implement things on and in real life this is what it looks like i, I wanted to show you this picture this is the reason why uh, i have the slide here because i want you to see a physical quantum computer before we leave uh, this particular uh, session okay and uh, i show you one figure maybe it means something to you maybe it doesn't but you know uh, hopefully uh, this is uh, i can convey the impressiveness of this of, of the thing so they are calculating a property of a chemical molecule which may be and in this case this is uh, heat division plus more they're trying to calculate something called the bond dissociation uh, energy and uh, never mind what this is it's a number that you would like to know and uh, and you can this is a simple enough problem that you can actually exactly solve it on a classical computer and what you see on the red is the classical computer solution and the experimental and the corrected experimental solutions you can see and they match quite well so the whole point is that this is proof of principle that you can actually design chemical molecules uh, and seek solutions of the kinds of design ideas that pharmacy has or so on, so on and so forth in the future on quantum computers and you know so now we're basically at the level where we're playing the toy we're, we're solving toy problems and showing that this can be done 
Okay, so I'm already at the 45 minute mark. So let me uh, quickly tell you the other uh, example, which is you know which is uh, related to banking. And here, actually, I'm going to shortcut the conversation um, again by basically pointing out a solution which is actually quite straightforward. Um, again, I'm assuming a very diverse background, so I apologize. I, I'm using analogies in the place of doing anything more serious than that, but I think this is about as much as we can do with a interdisciplinary science such as this. So what I want to point you towards is something called cryptocurrencies, which perhaps you've heard of Bitcoin as a kind of idea. Um, and if you're at all interested in finance and things of that sort, then you know more about this than I do already. Um, and the central point I want to just make about this is that Bitcoin is all about basically not trusting the bank, right? So typically, if you think of a usual uh, transaction where you go to SBI and make a transaction, there is a bank, there is a there is a there is an officer of the bank who uh, will note down or write down against your ledger that you have uh, added ten rupees or subtracted 10, ten rupees from your account for for this 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 valid transaction. And what that means is that the government controls the transactions that you're making. So if you take the point of view that this is not something that is favorable to you because you know you just want to be uh, independent and in a in an internationalized world, you would like to basically not have the government be able to control whether or not a transaction is considered valid or not, then um, you would go down the road, the mathematical road of trying to produce a decentralized ledger. And a decentralized ledger is basically a ledger where everyone agrees that you have 100 rupees, but everyone now, now how do you get people to stop cheating? This is the question. And the way you get people to stop cheating is by basically demanding something called proof of work. This is not the only technique, but I just want to highlight this because this allows me to very quickly tell you the answer in another five minutes. And proof of work, uh, it follows the following logic basically, which is I want, I ask you to do something very complicated. So I ask you, for instance, to, um, you know, just to give you a, a very bad analogy, I say to you, please uh, take a selfie in front of Taj Mahal. And if you do take a selfie in front of Taj Mahal, then I agree that you have traveled such a crazy thing that now I agree that what you are saying is the correct answer. And I write down, if you say that I don't have 100 rupees, I agree with you, right? This proof of work is such a task, but it's, it's more mathematically well-defined. It's a computationally difficult task to do, not impossible to do, but difficult to do. It's, it requires hardware resources and requires energy resources that you have to spend. Um, and when you spend that uh, uh, resources and you declare that you have done the work, like taking a picture in front of Taj Mahal, when you've done the work, it's easy to verify. I can look at the picture and say, yes, that's a picture of somebody in front of the Taj Mahal, right? So the verification step must be easy. Doing the work must require energy resources and hardware resources, and hence is difficult. And so what happens in this diagram that is in front of you, what is happening is that uh, somebody starts a ledger, and if you want to add something to it, and you want to say, now I have 100 you have to attach it to a proof of work. And so by doing that, you're, I'm actually demanding something very strongly of you. Now, <clears throat> what is, what did I just tell you about proof of work? Proof of work is something that is very difficult to find, right? It's a problem, it's a computational problem that's very difficult to solve, but very easy to verify, right? That's a needle in a haystack. I've already worked this out. That's a needle in a haystack. Proof of work involves literally needles and haystacks, right? So just, uh, I took this basically from a Forbes article. Right? Uh, cryptocurrencies do not have centralized gatekeepers and hence basically rely on distributed network of participants to validate the incoming transactions. Proof of work is a consensus mechanism to choose which of these network participants called miners are allowed to handle the lucrative task of verifying new data, right? So this is exactly what I just said to you in words. I want to add or subtract something from the ledger. How do I do this? How do I declare that I have more or less money than before? This is not allowed to everyone. This is allowed only if you prove to me that you've done some work. And this proof of work is a software algorithm, right? That basically just, um, the rest of this only just says, it's difficult to basically uh, uh, do, easy to verify. And what this diagram shows you is that if there are two chains, one is, is this purple chain, and the other is this black chain and the black chain has another offshoot which is purple here all these purple chains are the shorter links the longest link wins basically 
So this path is the longest path and that's the valid path. All other paths are kind of invalid. And this is a way in which you can, uh, you can uh, solve the problem that the needle in a haystack uh, can have many needles, can have more than one needle. So what happens is that sometimes I find a needle and you find another needle which is equally correct. And so both of us produce a solution. That's me producing the purple and you producing the black. Somebody randomly decides that I like this guy's solution better and they just run with it. And so this, this basically allows you to, uh, to have an authenticated uh, line basically. So this is just solves a uniqueness problem. Okay, but we're at the 15 minute mark. I can tell you this answer in one word. It's eminently Grover searchable. It's an unstructured database. So imagine that I have a quantum computer and everyone else in the world has a classical computer. If they take on average 10,000 runs of their classical computer to solve the problem, if my quantum computer takes the exact same amount of time per run as the classical computer, I can solve it in 100 runs. Which means I dominate Bitcoin. I, in a hundred runs, I can authenticate, I can authenticate, I can authenticate, I can authenticate, I can keep authenticating faster than anyone else can do anything else. So if you have one quantum computer, the entirety of Bitcoin as a space collapses, basically, because it completely becomes vulnerable to quantum attacks and it becomes vulnerable to unstructured database searches. Yeah. So this is um, uh, my attempt at basically trying to point out to you that uh, quantum computing as a field is basically really structurally very basically very across the field. And so uh, I don't know if the two examples made too much sense in the short amount of time that I had. Uh, but I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that lecture, sir. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, is this working, sir? Am I audible to you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, no, I was just saying thank you. Thank you for that lecture. Um, we will, with the kind of short amount of time that we have thank left, I think. Uh, with the amount of time that we have left, with, we'll, we'll go into uh, Q and A's. So uh, anybody who has any questions, feel free to kind of post them in the Q and A window, um, and and we'll kind of wait for that for for a minute. Perhaps in the in the meantime, what what we so when you do uh, uh, the the use case in finance. So you kind of you kind of let us know that one quantum computer you can destroy or, or dominate the entire um, Bitcoin space. In terms of financial transactions, is there also um, methods of kind of enhancing or or or, or, or improving, um, ma making this security stand yeah, more solid? Security, uh, because I mean, uh, the simplest answer to this question about security and uh, in finance is that um, A, there are post you know, there's post quantum encryption standards that you can move to. There are classical algorithms that are difficult to break. And so if you move to any of those, then basically quantum, uh, um, the existence of quantum computers or the existence of classical, you know, it solves all of these problems that have been brought up, um, you know. so. Wait, let me back up just for a second and, and make this comment clearly. There is a well-known kind of folklore about basically quantum computers make uh, uh, some sort of security risk for classical algorithms, some sort of encryption algorithms. So the particular algorithm at hand is called uh, the RSA algorithm. And uh, in this instance, basically, um, the, the financial world is, is immune, I think, more or less uh, you, you can anyone who really cares about it, defense finance, anyone who really cares about it, can just move to a, what's called a post encryption standard. And the post quantum encryption standard basically makes it, uh, uh, is an encryption which is difficult for a quantum computer to break, which means you've solved the problem basically. So now your adversary can have quantum computers and it doesn't bother you too much. Um, there are opportunities here that quantum computers uh, uh, provide in the finance space, which are actually 
um, uh, not unique to finance. They're actually just the fact that um, quantum computers are very have been shown in the recent past to be somewhat advantageous in solving partial differential equations and solving um, uh, linear regression problems, machine learning. So space by by folks in finance, where uh, where having a very very good understanding of quantum computing actually can be really uh, advantageous in solving all of those problems as well. And so um, uh, there are applications that are waiting to be uh, explored there. Um, but it relies on the existence of hardware that doesn't exist yet. So, you know, there are, this is a tricky conversation to have. Right. So I've, I've still kind of kept the Q and A's open. Um, so waiting for anybody who would like the question. If not, then of course the recording of the session is will be available to students to kind of uh, walk through. Just in case this was a little bit uh, too much to kind of go through it at one go, and then. Perhaps they can formulate some ideas um, as as they go through as they go through that as they go through. That. Okay. So it's fine, sir. I, I don't see uh, any questions at the moment. If there is anything, I'll of course I'll of course communicate that with you. But um, um, I don't see anybody posting anything right now. And um, people can just get in touch with me as well. I mean. Uh... Physics at uh, um, iitb.ac.in is the website, and you can find me there. Yes. So what I will do is once I share the recording with everyone, I also kind of share your contact just in case your, your email, just in case anybody wants to get in touch uh, about anything that we discussed here. Um, so if that's fine, then I'll just move into uh, doing a little bit of the um, closing remarks. Um, so yes. thank you, thank you so much, sir, for for taking the third and the fourth lecture of the fifth uh, masterclass series on critical and emerging technologies. Um, in these two masterclasses, we kind of explored quantum mechanics, um, discussed some of the limitations uh, of, of technologies in our times, and then move to some use case application or some practical examples of uh, quantum mechanics technologies. Um, the masterclass series once again uh, is supported by uh, the Trivenita Turbines Limited. Um, Thank you so much everyone for joining. Thank you so much, sir, for, for taking these lectures. Thank um, you again. Yes, thank you and, and leave it.